All right, we're ready. Okay, we've begun. Okay, great. Let's just give a minute here for folks to roll in. I see the numbers jumping up here. Um, yeah, good afternoon. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to our the final inst installation of our um, International Soil Carbon Network webinar series on, on, on soil carbon sequestration. My name is Jenny Sung. I'll be your host today on behalf of my co-organizers, Claire Phillips, Dan Lipson, uh, Eric Slesarev, and Susan Crow. And we're really excited uh, today for, for today's topic, uh, which is what are the soil carbon sequestration potentials of biochar and enhanced weathering? We've got two excellent speakers uh, today. Uh, first off, we'll have uh, Professor Johannes Lehman, who's the Liberty Hyde Bailey Professor of Soil Biogeochemistry and Soil Fertility Management at Cornell University. Uh, his research focuses on nanoscale investigations of soil organic matter, the biogeochemistry of, py of pyrogenic carbon and sequestration in soil, so sustainable soil management, climate change, and the circular economy. Uh, after Johannes, we'll have uh, Professor Dan Maxbauer, who is an assistant professor in geology in the department in the geology department at Carleton College, where he teaches courses on climate science and the carbon cycle. His most current research is focused on carbon dioxide removal through enhanced weathering and agricultural systems. Uh, so, uh, Johannes, why don't you go ahead and uh, pull up your slides here. Um, and as Johannes is presenting, feel free to uh, put your questions into the, the Q&A box, and then we'll leave about eight minutes after Johannes for, for questions. Uh, on his talk, and then after um, uh, the second presentation, we'll have uh, another eight minutes or so for questions on enhanced uh, rock weathering for Dan. So, all right, Johannes, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jenny, and thanks everyone for being with us today. Um, even though I can't see you, maybe you can see me. Uh, I want to share some thoughts on uh, biochar and climate change mitigation, uh, just with this pre amble that um, uh, none of these carbon dioxide removals make of course much sense uh, if we're not uh, expending all our efforts also to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuel use. Um, and then there are no silver bullets but we need to uh, explore all our options and biochar should be on the table as one of many options that we need to explore to the fullest um, just to get us on the right mindset uh, even though i will talk about biochar um, today uh, there are many other approaches and some of them i will benchmark against um, that need to be explored uh, there are typically three entry points that we need to consider when we uh, look at biochar systems and uh, the word systems is pretty important in all of this um, uh, the first entry point is uh, that by charring an organic matter that would otherwise have decomposed and released not just CO2 but N2O and CH4 potentially uh, in the process, if we're charring that uh, material, uh, it will reside um, as organic carbon for much longer than before. We'll talk about a bit about this aspect. Uh, then, of course, it is possible through the process of pyrolysis to generate renewable energy um, that can reduce fossil fuel use um, uh, in, in certain situations. And then there's a whole slew of um, uh, the third entry point of effects of uh, biochar additions on soil on methane and nitrous oxide emissions from soil. Uh, not from the biomass or the biochar, but from soil um, uh, that are increased or decreased, uh, as well as any primary productivity uh, uh, changes that can be considered. So those are the three entry points, and we'll we'll look at them uh, a little bit from a systems perspective um, and uh, where um, the different emission reductions uh, come from, uh, as well as whether an emission reduction also doubles up as a, a carbon dioxide removal strategy. 
Uh, it makes sense to look at it, and it's unfortunately not quite straightforward always to look at it in uh, compartmentalized in a biomass subsystem on the left, in a conversion subsystem where we make biochar out of biomass in the middle uh, that can generate energy uh, or sequesterable materials, um, and the soil subsystem on the right um, that generates um, different different emissions and emission reductions uh, that uh, can all of those can be parsed out into greenhouse gas emission reductions as well as a carbon dioxide removal from the atmosphere and you see here um, in, uh, in 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 blue um, the uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, non cdr derived uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions and in orange the cdr derived greenhouse gas emission reduction um, and and you'll see that um, they vary widely between the different subsystems um, uh, that uh, plant growth for instance uh, has um, a very different uh, ratio of, of cdr to ghg uh, than uh, than some of the other subsystems um, so it is uh, there are many moving parts uh, in this system um, and oops um, and uh, they are uh, there are many actors that are involved in this in these subsystems um, that makes the uh, conversation also uh, quite difficult um, uh, that, and this kind of view of systems view with these many actors and uh, partners and moving parts of emissions and emission reductions and CDR versus greenhouse gas only um, is uh, not unique to biochar um, uh, but uh, but it's pretty important to consider in biochar. Um, looking at, at emission reductions and CDR across biomass conversion and application uh, in soil um, shows you the relative, or very broad brush relative amounts uh, that can be reduced or actually sequestered um, as part of uh, a CDR uh, or a greenhouse gas emission reduction across these different um, uh, pinch points uh, that either only involve CO2 or they involve uh, also nitrous oxide and methane. Um, and, and some of them, as you see here from, from these arrows, um, are pretty dramatic changes. Uh, others are uh, very uh, small changes. Some of them are um, still very difficult to quantify and might remain difficult to quantify, such as uh, the ones uh, from soil-based N2O and, and methane emissions. Um, the, the, the possibly easiest to quantify um, is the persistence of biochar, uh, uh, potentially also to monitor, because we can uh, monitor the conversion of biomass into biochar in a conversion facility that is um, uh, I think relatively uh, straightforward compared to many other monitoring systems that require monitoring in the field. This can be done at point of conversion. Um, and it is by now uh, relatively clear that um, what, what the chemical uh, uh, conversion and the chemical modification is of biochar uh, from biomass, uh, the, the production of fused aromatic ring structures and larger clusters at higher temperatures um, that then also generate uh, materials that are decomposing more slowly in the environment. Here shown the F perm, so the fraction of permanent, um, permanent being for the defined period. In this case, it's 100 years. Uh, that is a typical IPCC, but also um, a, a typical value needed in the voluntary carbon markets. Um, uh, the IPCC uh, national greenhouse gas Guiding guidance um, document that was published in 2019 has in the appendix a, a method that um, uh, proposes temperature as the uh, predictor for F perm um, and uh, and and a no, a, a future um, uh, document for the U.S. may may expand that also to uh, properties uh, such as the hydrogen to carbon ratio. Um, there's a large scatter around the predictions. Um, you see that when using uh, 
properties rather than production conditions on the left side as temperature on the right side um, the properties uh, using h to c org values um, the using these property values uh, improves the predictions as you can see from the r squared um, uh, and uh, and and one may want to um, set thresholds um, rather than than using regressions um, uh, but in principle, it is very clear that a higher pyrolysis temperature uh, generates biochars with greater condensation and therefore um, uh, the ability to um, predict, uh, predict um, decomposition um, uh, over time through the conversion and, uh, and knowledge of the property or the production conditions. Um, the conversion of biomass to biochar, typically in life cycle assessments, takes up the lion's share of the emission reductions. You see here, um, life cycle assessments that doesn't even consider crop yield uh, changes um, uh, and uh, with different scenarios looking, uh, uh, taking a stover or uh, purposeful known uh, bioenergy crops, switchgrass uh, or waste biomass to convert into biochar and the dark blue uh, bar uh, is is if you sort of squint is the the, the largest part of uh, the emission uh, and emission reductions and that is the uh, persistent biochar. Um, so it, uh, converting something that decomposes quickly into something that decomposes slowly um, makes up the line share of um, of the emission reductions. Um, interesting is uh, for uh, nature-based or soil-based sequestration, um, but also for vegetation uh, sequestration, um, uh, to distinguish between true carbon dioxide removal and systems greenhouse gas emission reductions and where they sit um, with respect uh, to each other and where there might be trade-offs uh, or synergies between CDR and GHG emission reductions. Um, most of them uh, deliver both, most, most um, uh, uh, climate mitigation, climate change mitigation approaches, um, but there are some such as uh, uh, restoring wetlands that are probably more effective in, uh, re in increasing and in accruing soil carbon, um, and that is partially offset by uh, methane emissions, for example. Um, uh, biochar systems seem to uh, sit compared to cropland management, at least the data that are published uh, and can be reviewed uh, at the upper end um, and delivers greater systems greenhouse gas emissions than it delivers carbon dioxide removal. Uh, the synergy and trade-offs also pertain to crop yield um, and uh, soil carbon accrual. Um, in, in wetlands, we may expect that um, that with greater restoration of wetlands, we might also uh, displace uh, cropland uh, and therefore reduce um, uh, crop yield. Uh, whereas with uh, with biochar, we might expect that greater biochar additions to soil uh, might also, within reason, um, increase increase uh, crop yields. Um, global meta-analysis uh, data reveal uh, that. Uh, adding biochar to soil as an incentive for soil carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas emission reductions is unlikely to deliver any uh, crop yield increases. Um, but of course, there's a lot of detail and fine points hidden between such an average number um, and, and this is not taken with, with uh, a lot of caution. Um, overall, it seems that uh, inorganic fertilizer, the bump uh, that we can expect at, at the same location as uh, where biochar trials have been made and where we can directly compare it is in about the same order of magnitude as uh, from biochar additions. If you, if you plot that in this way with a fertilizer crop yield effect on the x-axis and the biochar crop yield effect on the y-axis, um, you might expect that there is a one-to-one -one relationship in that, that, um, uh, that uh, wherever you have good fertilizer uh, uh, effect uh, efficacy that you also have a good biochar efficacy in increasing crop yields, but that doesn't seem to hold. You see, this is more or less a scatter shot here um, that uh, that doesn't show 
uh, a clear relationship, not even if you're trying it to disaggregate by different uh, soil types. Um, uh, but that might also mean that there are um, you know, different crop yields and crop, uh, soil constraints are addressed by uh, an addition such as with biochar compared to a nutrient addition, which makes uh, complete sense. We're, we're uh, sort of familiar with, with uh, the, the, the observations of, um, of uh, non-responsive soils, non-responsive to fertilizer, that typically means, um, and, uh, uh, and, and the question is, you know, what, what soil constraints can be addressed by an amendment such as biochar or other amendments, organic amendments that are not addressed uh, by, by NPK fertilizer? And, um, and those are uh, some intriguing questions um, that, that emerge from that. Um, there is a spatial aspect uh, that um, is very intriguing to me uh, to think about biochar as a vehicle that um, addresses some concerns and opportunities in a circular economy, um, in, in particular circular uh, bionutrient economy as, we, as we're coining it, um, where uh, nutrient um, residues such as in this case what you're looking at is uh, poultry litter uh, in, in the state of, of Georgia in the United States um, is uh, concentrated in a few counties in that state. Uh, you see where the, the dark blue appears on, in the north part of the state um, and where there is phosphorus demands and, and a need for poultry litter additions um, due to its phosphorus content. And th those are, are uh, more likely to be in the southern part uh, of, of the same state. So how to get the poultry litter from the northern part of the state into the southern part and what kind of greenhouse gas emission reductions um, and carbon sequestration is, is associated with this. Um, and, and there are um, ways to do uh, optimization calculations and, and uh, think about you know, how, how do you need to transport that through, from one county to the other? How do you convert it? Where do you convert it? What's the economies of scale of an upgrading facility? And what does all of that uh, reduced transportation costs uh, mean for, um, for the economics, uh, the profit that you see here on the y-axis on the upper right side, uh, as well as the emission reductions, as well as the net carbon dioxide sequestration that you see on the lower right. And um, you can, uh, you, the, the discussions about uh, what that means for, for um, an, an optimum design for a problem such as that um, uh, is, is a, a pretty intriguing question um, that could also generate decision support systems. On a, on a, on a global scale, um, it is, um, of course, also the question, what uh, are the um, uh, greenhouse gas emission reductions and what of those are cost effective in this paper by uh, Stephanie Rowe et al. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, biochar uh, um, emission reductions are uh, significant and on par with, with BECs um, and, uh, and any other sequestration. Uh, and greenhouse gas emission reductions um, through nature-based solutions. And uh, always the, the upper bar is, uh, is the technical potential and the lower is the cost-effective um, potential at $100 per CO2 equivalent. And you can see um, that those are always reduced, uh, but for some technologies less than for others. And, and uh, because there are some um, uh, uh, co-benefits to biochar, uh, the reductions are relatively minor. Uh, compared to, for instance, afforestation uh, or BECs. Um, there are a lot of different problems with doing these kind of analysis that uh, um, all of you are, are familiar with, at least um, uh, from, from conversations uh, that, uh, uh, especially with biochar, we need to be sensitive to um, uh, competitive uses that we don't double count uh, the biomass that it's already used for something else um, and uh, that uh, the spatial reorganization that I showed earlier that that uh, um, are through the, the weight and volume concentration during pyrolysis are are extremely interesting are usually not included in these kind of analysis and and uh, and, and if anything this this paper showed um, that there's quite a 
a bit of uh, work cut out for us to to uh, figure out how we how we do this in the future a little bit better. Um, so uh, crop yield are of course uh, potentially a driver for adoption of nature-based solutions and especially soil carbon sequestration. Um, and uh, we were interested in, in thinking about um, what are some drivers for public support uh, for that. Um, and, and we were surprised to see that uh, soil carbon sequestration was was really supported with this dem uh, demographic of um, a over a thousand U.S. adults um, that uh, uh, that they were uh, pretty much supportive of using soil carbon storage uh, as a sequestration and climate change mitigation approach, um, and that it was really uh, no difference whether you're a Democrat or a Republican uh, or whether you're a farmer or non-farmer, um, and the same held actually true. Uh, for biochar, and there was no big difference in this survey um, between uh, uh, support for soil carbon sequestration in general uh, and and biochar uh, soil carbon sequestration in particular. Um, which now in the last couple of slides just uh, begs the question also um, uh, whether biochar uh, is is a is a material which I you know, typically say it's not, um, although one is maybe tempted to say it's 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 something or, or considered very often as something that comes in a bag or in, in a box um, uh, or is it is it a goal is it a system a discipline um, I would also argue it might be a, a way of investigating uh, a way of knowing um, having a lens a, a systems lens and and definitely uh, it became a community of practitioners uh, and, and scientists. I want to um, end with uh, a couple of slides um, that I think is very important to, to especially if you're thinking about systems research um, that involves nature-based solutions and the communities, um, then you need to involve the communities um, in the conversation. And we, we have been trying that with something that's called, uh, that we coined the Soil Factory uh, in Ithaca, New York, um, that uh, and Ithaca has been uh, on the record uh, with its new Green New Deal uh, to become the first city that is 100% decarbonized um, by 2030. And, and that is uh, really, as, as we seem to discover, really only possible if we do something with our wastes and recycle it. As long as we landfill um, our sewage, uh, uh, Ithaca will not be able to be carbon neutral and, uh, and uh, possibly one of the only ways of uh, of achieving that is is through pyrolysis, which seems to be also cost effective. Um, and and bringing the actors together and uh, considering that this is possibly not even a technological issue. Uh, it's not a scientific issue, but it's an attitude and a conversation issue. Uh, it's it's an issue of individuals not wanting to deal with um, with certain um, uh, um, ways of 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 knowing. Um, and trying out new things and talking about it. Um, and uh, I'll end with this. Um, one of the community outcomes with a global book launch that we had last uh, last week uh, was to, to think about uh, um, uh, uh, think about uh, poems about um, about things that you don't want to talk about usually, um, and uh, and whether uh, we need to bring all of it on the table and find find creative ways um, around a, a conversation that involves the public uh, as well as scientists. And with that, I'll um, thank you very much and uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks so much, Johannes. That was a really great presentation. And, and to the audience, please, please uh, do submit some questions into the Q&A box here. There's only a couple so far, but I'm sure there's many more out there. And so, um, I'll just get us started off with one that's been on my mind, Johannes. You know, you've been working on biochar now for a long time, I think over a decade at least. And uh, I'm sure you've seen companies come and go and maybe come back again who want to bring biochar to scale and, and sell biochar to farmers for its uh, soil health benefits or its carbon sequestration potential. And I'm kind of wondering, you know, what what is it that um, that these companies are missing, or or what is it that's inhibiting the growth of that market that I, you know, that I saw pop up in the early 2000s and kind of die down, and then it's coming back around. Is it is it our uncertainty around the science and the impact that biochar has um, in terms of its its permanence in the soil, or is it and, and its impact on yields, or 
uh, its impact on other, you know, soil health or, or soil metrics, or is it more of a logistics problem of, you know, not enough feedstock in the right places and uh, how you apply it with these machines or how you apply it at scale? You know, what, what do you think is is holding people back? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I no, I think uh, probably all of the above. Uh, some of it is just inertia in the system. Uh, we had the first uh, large wind turbines and photovoltaics in the 50s through the 70s, and and um, there's uh, in Ithaca still not a single wind turbine in in, in the region uh, because of nimbyism and and uh, just people just don't want to do it. The regulatory framework is not there, um, uh, so it's. There are a whole host of reasons. Some is just inertia um, that it just takes a long time, and that's maybe also just fine. Um, we, we have a lot of pressing issues, but it, um, it, there, there's a, a need for due diligence. There, um, uh, it is a, a, a potentially win-win um, uh, technology, such as soil carbon sequestration and, and especially biochar that that go cuts across of somebody needs to have biomass, somebody needs to convert it, and somebody needs to apply it. And, and across that value chain, everybody needs to uh, gain something from it and, it, and it includes different actors. That's very different from, um, from many other uh, sectors where, uh, you know, a, a, a low emissions car, you just you know you just deal with a car. Um, but here you have to deal with somebody uh, who has the biomass that probably needs to hand over the biomass to somebody who converts it, that hands it over to somebody who is applying it uh, on the soil. So you, you have three actors in this um, that need to do something, whereas an electric car, you have, you have one person. Um, and uh, so I think um, designing smart systems that deliver win-win um, uh, situations are, are also an Achilles heel. So uh, the, the, that that uh, uh, you know, designing sustainable systems um, are are more difficult when the more actors you have involved in making sure that that it is sustainable. That's one maybe one answer, but I think all of your your um, proposals are are uh, valid. Yeah, and another you know you mentioned you know in your paper looking at the price of uh, carbon being at like one hundred dollars per ton. I think and I think that's. Uh, I think that's much higher than the price for for soil carbon credits uh, going these days. You know, maybe that's maybe three to five times the price. But if biochar is persistent for longer, then maybe it would be worth that price. So that could be another driver. Yeah. Is kind of the the, the price. And, of that. and I think that's a that's a good point to make. Um, no, I, and and that's not germane to to um, to biochar, uh, but but to parse out what portion of the greenhouse gas emission reduction is carbon sequestration and carbon dioxide removal, so true CDR um, versus GHG emission. And some of the uh, carbon trading platforms are now advertising specifically, they only monetize the CDR portion of the greenhouse gas emission reductions. And that's a reason um, why they, they, they claim um, they can command higher prices, because it's not just about a reduction in emissions, it's about actual withdrawal of CO2 from the atmosphere, which some uh, clients are inclined to dole out more money for than for simple greenhouse gas emission reduction. So th there are some, some possibilities there. Yeah, and then we have a question in here about kind of what, what the biggest trade-offs are for converting organic matter um, to biochar. So for example, if a farmer is uh, pr practicing no-till agriculture and leaving stubble on, on the ground. Are there trade-offs uh, uh, between leaving that stubble on the ground and harvesting it and, and adding it back as, as biochar? Yeah, yeah uh, crop crop residues, um, obviously, uh, they're depending on the soil. Um, in, in the Cerrados in Brazil, you can remove a lot less crop residue than uh, in a mollisol in, um, in, in Saskatchewan. Uh, so there, there are big differences regionally by, by soil and cropping system, how much crop residue you can even remove. But removing crop residues is also a, a huge cost. Um, if if the, uh, the the collection of crop residues um, uh, no, is, is, uh, um, uh, is uh, weighed against the crop yield benefits uh, of adding biochar, um, then, most in most situations, one will find not a very favorable um, uh, result of that. So, uh, no, any any collection at this point um, uh, needs to be thought through very very rigorously. Um, but there are uh, for 
you know, the, the, the minimal adoption that, um, that happens and occurs at the moment, one would argue, uh, be able to argue that uh, there is enough waste biomass that's already on a pile um, that could be pyrolyzed before any collection is done. And, and yes, one would need to be um, very conscious of uh, how much crop residues one would remove. But there are good, good estimates for different regions and, and, uh, and there, are, there are at least some data how much one can remove, uh, not for all ecosystems, um, but for, for many. Okay, and then maybe just one last quick question here as, um, as Dan uh, gets his screen set up would be great. So there's a couple questions in here around um, biochar and, and compost or, or manure combinations. And, um, you know, can you tell us a little bit more about, um, you know, applying biochar itself versus in combination with other organic matter uh, amendments? Something yeah. Kind of um, the, uh, the, the crops still need nutrients. Um, so, um, biochar additions um, without any other additions um, is is most likely to fail in all in all circumstances um, if one thinks about uh, making other materials such as inorganic fertilizer additions or composts um, more effective I, I think that's a great way of thinking about it um, making composting more effective um, is a great way of thinking about it um, and uh, and and also thinking about the balance between uh, long-term carbon accrual and short-term carbon cycle. So for for that reason alone, um, in in many situations, I would think that a combination between compost and biochar is a good way forward. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Johannes, for your presentation. Thank you. Um, next up, we have Dan Maxbauer talking about enhanced uh, weathering and using some uh, high-tech screen sharing so that we can see your face. So thanks so much, Dan. Take it away. All right. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, hopefully my Zoom window via GoToMeeting webinars uh, comes through great for everyone. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here um, and to tell you guys a little bit about um, some of the work I've been doing in enhanced weathering, but sort of hopefully provide a little bit of an overview of enhanced weathering in general um, and some of the ways we think about potentials for carbon removal, um, specifically in agriculture. There's a, a few other applications of enhanced weathering, but I won't get into those too much today. Um, so, uh, oops, here we go. There we go. Enhanced weathering um, is sort of a, a, an emerging thing that's been getting a lot of attention in the last few years. Um, I, I, I became involved with it um, through research over the last couple of years, developing a field trial um, on campus at Carleton College, um, which is in southeast Minnesota, about 50 miles south of the Twin Cities area in, um, in Minnesota. And um, you're looking at effectively uh, the beginnings of enhanced weathering uh, using infrastructure that already exists in agriculture. So the, the truck you see um, is a spreading truck, usually um, used for traditional liming materials like crushed carbonate rocks. Um, but instead of spreading crushed carbonates, it's spreading pulverized silicate rocks, um, or it could be spreading pulverized sort of silicate materials, industrial wastes of different types. Um, and when you sp spread this material on the ground, this is what it looks like you're putting a lot of surface area um, on the ground. We, people tend to refer to this stuff as rock dust. Um, what you're looking at here is um, application of about 10 tons an acre of basaltic rock dust that was involved in the field trial I'll tell you a little bit about later today. I wanted to provide this for just sort of perspective of what this stuff looks like when it's on the ground. Um, the field we're working in is no-till, and so uh, you see a lot of crop residues. We were just talking about those. Um, in the prior presentation. And, and um, so this material is integrating into the soil from when it gets spread in the fall over the winter into the growing season, along with some of this um, organic crop residue um, that's left on the field as well. Um, and the idea is that when we apply this material, that enhanced or that increased surface area provides the opportunity for silicate uh, min minerals to react with carbon dioxide and water. And so I wanted to include this reaction, and I'll have to move my little zoom window here. Um, I wanted to include this reactions to provide a little bit of context for 
um, the process that's involved when we talk about enhanced weathering. Um, and I want to make sure to, to say that um, so, sort of just like we're using in existing infrastructure um, and the idea of spreading crushed materials on farm fields as soil amendments isn't really a new idea. Either is the idea that those silicate minerals can re remove carbon dioxide through weathering reactions. These are really well-known processes um, to geologists. So since the 1950s, people have been working on um, geologic carbon cycling and this, the, the sort of interaction between silicate minerals and carbon dioxides, a well-known um, feedback mechanism to remove CO2 from the atmosphere over geologic time. So the idea is hopefully accelerating these reactions to make carbon removal um, increase at rates that are relevant for humans. Um, so if you take a silicate mineral, and this is just an example, and it reacts with CO2 and water, um, it produces ca uh, cations, in this case calcium. Um, it could be magnesium, potassium, other types of metal cations that are present. Um, and it also produces bicarbonate, and that bicarbonate is a key contributor to alkalinity in the pore waters. Um, and it also represents the carbon sink for CO2 in the system. So this is an inorganic mechanism to remove carbon. It's very different than the sort of organic carbon sinks people think about in agriculture. Um, and so I always like to emphasize that this is not an or a way to remove organic carbon. It's a way to remove CO2 um, via inorganic carbon sequestration. Um, and I believe that's next, oh, sorry. Um, and so the two, the two pathways, I guess, that that bicarbonate can go, once the bicarbonate forms, it's sort of removed the CO2. That CO2 can, or that bicarbonate molecule can sort of make its way through the watershed into the river systems and into the ocean, or it can precipitate a carbonate mineral in the soil or in any other part of the um, it's, it's sort of transport path. Um, and either of those two sinks are thought of as being relatively permanent and stable, stable um, potentially for more than a thousand years. Um, some, there's some ambiguity in that with regards to sort of um, conditions along that transport path um, with the bicarbonate, but these are thought of as pretty robust, pretty stable sinks for CO2 um, to enter into. Um, a really great sort of side effect of enhanced weathering is that it comes with lots of co-benefits um, in agriculture that um, sort of make it a win-win both from a carbon removal perspective and hopefully delivering value to farmers who are adopting these practices. Um, a couple things I haven't noticed, uh, mentioned yet would be that it, it, um, these materials release cations like you saw calcium, magnesium, other elements that can be useful mineral nutrients um, and have been shown to improve crop yields. Um, they can be an alternative to traditional lining materials um, like crushed carbonate rocks, or at least reduce the dependence on traditional materials. Um, and they can um, provide sort of a, uh, a source of plant available silica um, that can help with drought and pest resilience. Um, and then the last two points there are things that are sort of emerging over the last couple of years as folks have been working on this more. One would be, be the idea that's um, not new over the last couple of years, but um, that the secondary mineral formation as these rock powders dissolve um, might act as stabiliz stabilizing mechanisms for, for the organic carbon pool. So hopefully there'll be a positive connection between rock dust and organic carbon as well. Um, and uh, people have also been um, reporting reduced emissions of nitrous oxide as well um, through, through pH buffering in the soils. Um, so a lot of um, people are interested in thinking about the potential. So this all sounds great. What's the, what's the upside? What's the maximum potential um, that people might expect if you're spreading rock dust in agricultural systems? Um, there's sort of three classes of materials that people think about when they work with enhanced weathering in agriculture. Um, and those are listed down here on the x-axis of this plot. Um, ultramafic igneous materials, mostly olivine or dunites and other types of ultramafic rocks that have really high concentrations of olivine, which is a mineral. Um, mafic igneous rocks, like uh, sort of common volcanic rock basalt um, and, and gabbros, 
Um, and then there's industrial wastes, which are steel slags, blast burn slags, um, recycled concrete, other byproducts from the cement industry. Um, all of these materials have potential to remove carbon, mostly based on the, the percentage um, of their composition that's made up of calcium and magnesium. And so that's what's plotted on this left side y-axis, um, is the concentration of calcium and magnesium. Um, you can use that to convert um, into a, a, effectively a ratio that tells you the carbon removal potential. Um, and so you can think of this as sort of uh, the, the amount of CO2 that would be removed if you dissolved um, a, a, a certain weight of rock material. So the tons of CO2 removed per ton of rock material dissolved. Um, you'll notice ultramafic um, uh, feedstocks and industrial waste feedstocks have the highest potentials. Um, those materials also tend to break down the fastest. Um, but they also come with some amount of risk based on um, heavy metal contaminants um, that might be um, present and, and their availability depending on where you are in the world. Um, mafic feedstocks like basalts um, have a more diverse uh, metal cation mix or, or nutrient mix, um, tend to have much lower um, uh, toxic elements present in them. Um, and, uh, come with sort of reduced maximum potentials, but still pretty robust um, potentials. So anywhere from one ton to a half a ton of CO2 could possibly be removed um, through the dissolution of these um, rock products. Okay, and so people have sort of taken that basic idea and adapted it and sort of um, try to extrapolate based on, on ideas like that, using models, what the sort of upside to enhanced weathering could be. And there's been a lot of recent work on based on models. I just grabbed the titles from a, hand, a smattering of studies um, that are able to sort of take some of the things I was just mentioning, um, dissolution rates, maximum potentials, and then even incorporating uh, more complex interactions between organic carbon, microbial life in the soils, um, the climate of the area, the soil properties, et cetera. Um, and a general takeaway would be that if applied at scale across the globe, enhanced weathering could potentially remove gigaton uh, one to two to three gigatons of, of CO2 per year, which is really exciting upside. Um, obviously, that would come with lots of um, infrastructure and application development, um, but the, the upside is certainly there. Um, another way people have pursued this is through thinking about um, pot studies or greenhouse studies where they're growing plants in controlled environments where they are treating the soils with um, some type of silicate amendment. And in, in results from these studies, um, the realized carbon removal rates are almost always much lower than the theoretical maximums, um, something like 1 to 15% efficiency rather than anything close to 100% uh, efficiency. So um, if you apply 100 tons of rock dust, you're only removing um, 1 to 5 tons of CO2, something like that. Um, and in these Greenhouse studies, um, sort of in part due to the nature of the studies, researchers were trying to determine and, and figure out how to measure a signal of these materials dissolving and, and sequestering carbon. Um, the application rates tend to be really high, like something like 100 to 200 tons of rock powder per hectare. Um, that's something like 40 to 80 tons per acre. Um, and so those are probably higher than, than um, farmers would adopt um, as a practice in agriculture. Um, and so there's this um, sort of mismatch between what modeling studies suggest is the maximum potential of enhanced weathering and what greenhouse and pot studies and sort of observational data suggest are actually the realized rates over, over a single year, over one, one to five year type timescales. Um, 
but field conditions are really hard to mimic in the lab. Um, and so the, the uh, biological life in the soil, when you, when you work things in a greenhouse, is different than when you're out in an in a agricultural field where things can remain more undisturbed. Um, and so this mismatch maybe between sort of greenhouse studies and, and our observations and models has really emphasized the need for field, field studies. Um, and, and that was where I jumped into this world of enhanced weathering a couple of years ago. Um, and I'll show a, a quick uh, list of folks working on this. There's been a lot of field trials that have gotten off the ground over the last maybe four years, but certainly within the last two years, there's been a lot of activity. Um, and the field trial, uh, as I mentioned, that we've started at Carleton is, is um, effectively right on campus. And I'll show a quick um, map. This is the campus of Carleton College down here in the, the left corner, the bottom left corner of the left side image there. Um, as I mentioned before, it's we're about 50 miles south of the Twin Cities. It's We're, we're in a very heavily agricultural area. Um, and this big area um, in the middle of this map uh, is all part of the Carleton Arboretum. And in this you formerly was all agricultural land and the field trial area that we're working on is still an agricultural field um, that, that's owned by the college and it's farmed in collaboration with Peterson Farms, which is just right across the road. So um, it's been kind of an exciting opportunity to, to work with the local agricultural community and try to pursue something um, together and sort of see what value what values they bring to the um, this work as well. Um, our, our field trial is set up as a randomized block design where we have four different blocks, three different treatments of one control, one basalt, and one slag. Uh, so one natural volcanic rock and one industrial waste product compared against a control. Um, our field area is, is farmed as a corn soybean rotation um, with minimal tillage, so it's sort of a no-till system. Um, with lots of crop residue left on the ground year over year. Um, so we applied these products last fall and we just are finishing our first season of monitoring results um, during the growing season. Um, and again, to show you what these things look like on the ground and say a little more about our, our treatments, um, we applied basalt on the left um, at 10 tons an acre and um, if you apply the carbon removal efficiency or the potential ratio that we expect something like two and a half tons per acre of carbon to be removed um, as when, when and if all of this material were to dissolve. Um, for slag, we applied about two tons an acre um, and the carbon removal potential for that material is a lot higher. It has much more calcium and magnesium in it. Um, and so that's about 1.5 tons an acre is, is the expectation there. Um, we applied much less slag than basalt because the um, sort of liming properties of slag are much stronger um, than they are for basaltic uh, minerals in composition. And so we, we wanted to make sure we didn't overline the material, the, the soils. Um, we have a relatively um, a comprehensive, we hope, monitoring plan. We'll, um, we spent a lot of time this summer monitoring greenhouse gas flux and um, measuring water chemistry from um, shallow isometers, which I'll say some more about in a second. Um, we'll be doing crop yield, nutrient analysis, looking at soil carbon, soil properties, um, and looking at the organic components of the soils, the microbial community as well. Um, but today I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the pore water chemistry. Um, which we sampled using vacuum lysimeters. They're about 15 centimeters um, deep in the soil. So they're collecting surface water from the soil effectively. Um, and this is what these devices look like. You hook them up to a vacuum pump and you're, we're able to go out there and hopefully collect water um, throughout the growing season. Um, today, I'll just show um, some of our data on total alkalinity. Although um, you can see the list there of what we plan to measure on the, on the water samples we've collected. Um, I had a group of students work really hard to get out into the field and make these measurements. Uh, and one of the first things we learned was that water is really hard to collect from soils, um, especially when you're working in a non-irrigated field that's well-drained um, and it doesn't rain very much over the summer. So we were out there for a 12-week research period um, the students were in the field two to three times a week, and we only came up with six weeks 
uh, worth of quality water data. Um, and so uh, one quick just note on sort of challenges of running these field trials is when you're trying to measure something that's dissolving, um, it, 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 you're limited with your, the availability of being able to actually make the measurements that you want to make, which requires collecting water. Um, but when we did, when we were able to collect water, um, the data was was relatively exciting. Um, this is our total alkalinity against um, time, and you can see each treat, treatment is represented with a different color. Um, and a couple of quick notes to make. One is that with basalt versus control, um, we really didn't see a consistent or significant difference between those two. So whatever signal we're getting with basalt. Um, seems to be too um, weak to be able to pick up with alkalinity measurements. Um, in contrast, slag, uh, the, the slag fertilizer we, utilize, we, we are testing had a two to three times higher alkalinity um, relative to controls, and that is almost exclusively because of elevated concentrations of bicarbonate that are present in the pore water and the slag um, plots relative to control. So we're very excited about that. Um, that. That represents sort of like a two to three times increase in carbon removed from the system. Um, one of the things we've been working hard on the last few weeks as this data has been, been finalized is sort of a water budget model to then take that, that this alkalinity data and turn it into um, uh, an estimate of carbon removed over the growing season or for, for the year. Um, and to, to wrap up, I just wanted to say um, a little bit about ongoing field trials. Um, I'm certainly not the only field trial that's, that's uh, underway, and we're probably on a smaller scale or smaller end of um, field trials that are, that are um, off the ground now. There's some big uh, uh, multidisciplinary groups out of the University of Cornell, UC Davis, um, University of Illinois, Yale, um, that have partnerships with nonprofits and, and some corporate um, or startup corporations that are starting um, to all jump into this space over the last couple of years. Um, and so it's a very exciting space to be working in and there's a lot of energy um, pushing forward, trying to take all that exciting potential from those modeling studies and, and see how it plays out in the field along with farming partners and, and local communities where these materials vary across the country and across the globe. Um, a few quick comments before before I wrap up on um, just sort of where things stand by my um, view. Um, field trials do seem to be demonstrating that enhanced weathering removes carbon, which is good. Um, so what we sort of knew from a fundamental perspective does appear to be true when we can make the right measurements. Um, but in terms of going to any type of carbon market, um, monitoring, reporting, and verification methods definitely need a lot of work. Um, that's what I, I think most folks are really focusing on and I expect will be a lot of development over the next couple of years. Um, in a, an important point is sort of the associated impacts um, of rock dust that don't have to do with co-benefits or carbon removal um, need to be carefully monitored and studied as well. So sort of negative impacts on organic carbon pools, um, metal contamination, any type of negative effect needs to be pretty carefully um, monitored and, and something that's sort of a new um, potentially scalable idea before as things scale or if before things scale. Um, being sure to be careful about those things is important. Um, and it, uh, being sure that enhanced weathering is compatible with other regenerative agricultural practices. Um, I know some people have looked at uh, sort of code, de code deploying enhanced weathering products along with biochar and um, sort of different mixes of how to, to blend these things together and make them compatible and work together um, are, are, are things I think will be important moving forward. Um, so with that, I will um, I will say thank you and, and happy to address a question or two here to end, wrap things up. Awesome, thanks so much, Dan. Yeah, there's a bunch of questions rolling in here. I'll try to get to as, as many of them as possible in the last remaining minutes, but um, there's a few questions around kind of, um, I guess the the full LCA outcomes. You know, I think we can learn a lot from, from biochar as, as soil amendment and some of the the research that Johannes was showing about the the cost of production and transportation and application versus the carbon sequestration potential. What's the what's the status of research around that for um, yeah these silicon amendments? Yeah, um, that's a great great question. I didn't include anything in in um, 
this talk about that, but a lot of people have looked at life cycle uh, assessments based on um, sort of crushing, transport, spreading, grinding when you get it to different, to, to get different projects and then to get it to actual farm fields. Um, and the short answer is that um, is so long as um, these products, if you look at the life cycle, you know, if you look at the, the potential for their carbon removal over maybe a five year to 10 year window, um, the, those other associated emissions are something like maybe 10 to 20% um, of the carbon removal potential. So they do reduce that, that total number, um, but there, it's still a big net neg a potential big net negative. Um, and I think the um, analyses that have been published are using like those these maximum potentials. And something that I think a lot of people are carefully looking at is now as field trial data starts to roll in, you can do more careful life cycle assessments. But two or three years ago, that wasn't really possible because those those experimental data were not available. Yeah, that's really interesting. I think um, the, the point that these field trials and even pot studies are, are um resulting in, in different rates than those theoretical uh, initial values is something I learned today that's really important to keep in mind. And so there's another set of questions here around kind of what determines that that rate uh, of conversion uh, from CO2 into um, uh, with, with the basalt, you know, is it uh, just the surface size and the exposure of the rock or are there other uh, microbial interactions or interactions with pH, temperature, moisture, yeah. are we still, you know? Okay, all of the that. above. Yeah, so it's yeah. it's all of the above. Um, it starts with um, the mineralogy. So um, the, uh, the types of material that's, that you're spreading is one of the maybe first order controls. Um, so for instance, the mineral olivine, a magnesium silicate, um, has the fastest dissolution rate. And so a lot of early work focused on olivine um, and I think a lot of people still are focused on olivine. Um, there's a couple downsides to it. It's not as widely available. Um, and it, it can have slightly elevated met, uh, metal concentrations, heavy metal concentrations. Um, and, but there's certain types of volcanic basalts that have lots of olivine in them. And there's other minerals that have dissolution rates that are um, slower but compatible to that. So sort of the composition of the material has a, a, a really high control on that or strong control. Um, then things like grain size, the finer the grain size, the more surface area that's available to weather. Um, it's pretty well understood at this point that um, the, the fungal and bacterial communities in the soils are pretty active at mining and um, dissolving silicate minerals for nutrient sources. And so um, there's biological controls. Um, soils with acidic pH are much uh, more likely to be successful targets for enhanced weathering because the lower pH will um, contribute to faster weathering rates. Um, and uh, yeah, so sort of I think almost everything you listed has a bearing on this. Um, and one thing I didn't say in terms of composition, a lot of the industrial waste products like the steel slag um, has a pretty high percentage of silicate minerals that are sort of amorphous. They cool very quickly during the, in their respective industrial processes. And so those materials have really quick um, dissolution rates um, faster than most sort of natural silicate materials. Interesting. So it sounds like other than just the carbon uh, impacts, we, there's other kind of environmental outcomes that we need to take into consideration here. You mentioned kind of toxicity potentials a, a couple of times. Can you speak yeah. a little bit more to that and these different feedstocks? Yeah, I think it's um, a cons most of these heavy metals are, are in low trace amounts in all of these materials. Um, depending on certain, certain feedstocks can have um, sort of slightly elevated amounts of maybe chromium or nickel or other types of heavy metals. Um, I think one emerging uh, consensus seems to be that um, rightfully a lot of people are concerned about that, but depending on how many times a product would be applied in an area, um, in most agricultural settings, those, those heavy metals aren't, aren't mobile. 
um, or don't appear to be mobile, at least with one application. Um, and so um, the literature on that, I think, is still, at least with regards to enhanced weathering applications, um, is rightfully concerned. Um, and that's something people are monitoring as, as people look to find different feedstocks, figure out how things could scale and what the draw drawbacks are for various things. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. There's a bunch of other questions in here we, we don't have time to get to, but I really appreciate your presentation today and also Johannes as well. And thanks all for the, uh, being such an engaged audience and for participating in this webinar series. Thank Take you. Care.